Today we're going to talk about UK drone classifications. This video is aimed towards UK hobby flyers seeking to understand what is coming or those wanting an update on progress. We will explain what drone classes are and ask where is the labelling system we hoped would be included now on drones like the DJI Air 2S. This video will explain the whole process including an update from within the drone industry with Andrew McQuillan of Drone Masterclass. So if you already know what drone classes are and that we are waiting for labels, there are chapters in the timeline below and also in the description to allow you to hop around and get the information you want. So now you know, let's get started. probably more than aware by now, there are a new set of drone rules which cover the UK airspace. If you'd like more information on the new rules and how they impact your drone flights, there is a link to our playlist in the description. As well as a wide range of content focused on drones and tech, here at Geeksvana we put out updates to our UK drone rule series regularly. So if this type of content is of interest to you, please subscribe. Please keep in mind that with this particular video, we're looking to explain the upcoming drone class and label system, so legacy drones will not really be discussed. And remember, as it stands, the UK CAA has stated that all sub 250 gram legacy drones, so ones without the C label like the Mavic Mini, which you purchase today will be able to fly in the A1 airspace indefinitely. So that's worth remembering. To explain what drone classes are clearly, we need to include a step above and talk about airspace. So today I'll discuss the airspace type and the type of drone you'll be able to fly there once we have labels. Part of the new UK drone rules which came into place at the start of 2021 identifies different types of airspace we can fly our drones in. The category of most interest to UK hobby flyers looking to enjoy their DJI Mini 2 or Femi X8 is the open category. This category is then split into three subcategories. They are A1, otherwise known as flyover people. Flights in this airspace are only permitted by small drones which present a very low risk of harm. So if it drops out of the sky and hits someone or something, the damage will be limited. In terms of future drone class, you'll be able to fly C0 and C1 labeled drones here. The definition of a class C0 drone is a very small unmanned aircraft, including toys, that are less than 250 grams maximum takeoff mass, have a maximum speed of 19 meters a second, which is about 42 and a half miles per hour, are unable to be flown more than 120 meters, 400 feet above the takeoff point. These drones, along with the legacy sub 250 gram drones, will be able to be flown in congested areas without any separation and, as I said before, flown over people. All you'll need to do to qualify is register the drone if required due to a camera and read the user manual. The definition of a C1 drone is an unmanned aircraft that is either less than 900 grams takeoff mass or are made and perform in a way that if they collide with a human head, the energy transmitted will be less than 80 joules. C1 label drones will also need to have a maximum speed of 90 meters a second again and be designed and constructed to minimize injury to people. There are also standards requiring noise limits, height limits, and remote ID and GWA awareness systems. You can fly these C1 drones in the same congested area airspace as the sub 250 gram drones, but there can be no intentional flights over people. The qualification required here would again be register the drone, online training and a foundation test. So, DIMARES, the Drone and Model Aircraft Education Scheme, needs completing fully with an operator ID and flyer ID. This will be particularly exciting if drones like the Air 2S get C1 labels, although personally I feel they'll probably get a C2 classification from that particular drone, uh, but that's a subject for another video. So to summarise, the A1 airspace, which allows you to fly in congested areas and over people with no separation requirements, needs a C0 or C1 or legacy sub 250 gram drone to fly there. But you will not need to take anything more than the foundation drone registration test, which gives you your flyer ID. Next up, and we have the next airspace category to join A1, which as you might expect is called A2 otherwise known as fly close to people. This subcategory is simple. You'll need a C2 class drone to fly here and you'll need to hold an A2 CFC or certificate of competency. 
which is a theory test. Just a quick note here that our video sponsor today, Drone Masterclass, offers such a course. There's a link in the description to their site, so go check it out. You must be flying a Class C2 drone to be allowed to fly within congested areas and close to people in the A2 airspace. Specifically, separation distances are a standard 30 meters from uninvolved people, which can be further reduced to just five meters using the one-to-one -one rule when the system's low speed mode is selected. Then you have A3, which is the final of the three subcategories of airspace within the open category, and this is basically for everything else. C3 and C4 labeled drones, which are basically your heavier or privately built drones without labels. This is also the airspace where all of our existing legacy drones will go to die. I mean, be flown. So right now, if you are flying your Air 2S or similar drone without a label within the A2 airspace with an A2 CFC, then these drones will drop down to the A3 airspace. In terms of separation, we're talking about 50 meters from uninvolved people and no flight within 150 meters horizontally of residential, commercial, industrial areas, etc. Very much similar to the old hobbyist rules here in the UK last year. One special and important mention I want to give here is to what is called the Article 16 authorization. This allows members of certain associations and clubs to fly their drones within recreational areas, such as parks, under a set of improved rules. They're limited, but for many people who fly FPV or enjoy visiting such park locations for flights, it's a really great way to keep flying without the need for a sea label drone or legacy drone issues, etc. Now, the authorization is only for a year at the moment, but there is no indication it will not be renewed. There is a link in the description to our video explaining the Article 16 authorization, so take a look at that. Now, that wasn't drone class related, but it was important to mention it as we're talking about where you'll be able to fly. That is about the most jargon-free and clear explanation of the UK drone class system I can give without making this video look more like a complex battle plan than an explainer. As we stand, the legacy period for your existing non-label drones ends on the 1st of January 2023, which will also be when all manufacturers need to label their drones before they can sell them for use within these subcategories. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions on this section of the video and I'll do my best to seek the answers for you. Next, we're going to talk about when. Recently, DJI released a wonderful new drone with some impressive specifications. The DJI Air 2S boasts amazing tech, which would usually put it squarely at the top of any UK drone flyer's wish list. Unfortunately, the drone did not receive a C label. The reason is simple. The system itself isn't yet available to manufacturers. I sat down with Andrew McQuillan of Drone Masterclass to talk about the industry and what the industry is talking in terms of what needs to happen for the label system to start and how long it might take. This is a conversation which is happening within the industry an awful lot within the drone industry. I'm having this conversation with um, a lot of professionals um, in the UK industry. And I thought it would be good to bring that to the audience a little bit to update them as far as what's happening or not happening and could be happening, etc. So w w what is the situation as far as you're aware um, uh, regarding C labels? I think, well, I think the first thing to say is sort of to give some context about why there is no finalization on this is I think within government, there is still a piece of work to happen in relation to whose ownership this sits under. Right. Because I did a, again, this is product labeling, not necessarily, you know, it's, it's, it's very much a imported product to the UK issue than it is a specifically an aviation issue in terms of the actual labeling. So obviously the CEA and DFT and a few others are involved in terms of setting the standard for what that will be. But coming down to who actually is responsible for importing such things is not the normal purview of the CEA. I don't necessarily think, in my opinion, they want that right. as a responsibility. Yes. Because there's already existing government structures that can make that happen. So yeah, I think the problem is, first of all, who owns this issue? It's very clearly DFT and CEA have you know, have some skin in this fight, yes, but yes. The, it's not solely their fight, essentially, in terms of that. So, and also then you've got some non-aviation factors coming in, in terms of what's going to be included in the standard. It's hard to sort of contextualize those really well at the moment, because it's quite a fluid situation still. Yes, exactly. Um, and and, and w w whenever we have, you know, it, it, it should also be remembered by the audience that we are 
sitting outside of the EASA regulations from the point of view that we that yeah. we that we adopted those via this the cap 722 so there are always going to be changes like like the sub 250 gram um uh, uh, unique um uh, changes we have here in the UK as opposed to the EU there there are going to be subtle changes to to make this a UK thing and therefore of course there's a lot more UK departments that, that this is going to have to go through um and I, I do think it's interesting for the for the audience to hear that as as, as, as far as this isn't just waiting for the CAA or or a body to to actually say okay yes you can start using these labels now because of course it has to be defined. The elephant in the room as well is that we are going to see remote ID within this in some form or other. Um, <laughs> Who said that? Uh, <laughs> the, it, it's it's you know whilst remote ID as a date for implementation has been removed from the specific category, remote ID is very much still on the table. Yes, um, and. You know, it's things like that that will be a massive miss opportunity for the if the government have to bring out several changes to what drone spec is. Yes, that's a problem. Whereas yeah. to, to bring it out together and this class markings essentially um, will make it easier for implementation. So yeah, it's it's one of those things that there's lots of different cogs spinning at the moment within government, um, and until they all come into the slot into the final spaces, uh, we're not going to see it come forward as a standard, let alone to manufacturers, because their uptake is going to be crucial. I think we could, personally, I think we could see a lack of certain types of CMARC drones because of lack perceived lack of demand. I think C2 could be interesting in terms of what's brought out and how quickly, um, because I just think the manufacturers will be careful in their adoption. Okay, and, and in your personal opinion, would you think there should be and could be an extension to the legacy period. We all need to get into these new rules and way of, of doing it as one, because I think that there's a growing disparity between the people who are adopting the drones now and people with legacy arrangements. Yes. I, I, I personally feel we need to merge that together as okay. soon as possible, because I think some operators are at a disadvantage at the moment because they've come in with quite stricter new rules, like, you know, cylinder versus the old bubble. Um, but and they can't get those reduced until the C-Mark drones are in play. So I, I feel that the new operators are at a disadvantage compared to legacy operators. But um, as, as far as actual legacy drones are concerned, so, you know, the fact that I can fly my my Air 2 or, or next week my Air 2S, if I end up probably getting one, um, <laughs> another DJI drone to add to the collection. Um, uh, that, that, of course, doesn't have the, the the markings, so I can't go within five metres of people. But, it, you know, it, it still has its uses with, with, with the 50 metre rule in congested areas. Do, do you think that side of the legacy could be extended or or, or do, do you think that could be useful? Because without the new drones to purchase, you're going to have a lot of people with A2 CFC qualifications at the end of 2022 if the labels aren't in place and, and there aren't products on the market because the labels haven't been out for long. Um, then we're going to have a situation where we've got nothing to fly in the A2 CFC class. I, you know, the legacy stuff, don't expect to be able to use it in the open category Definitely beyond the end of next year, really, in my opinion, you know, once this stuff starts to come into in, into place. But yeah, I think that okay. if you're buying something new like that, you need to consider the yes. the longevity of it. Absolutely, indeed. And I, I'm, I'm saying that a lot to people at the moment who are asking my opinion on these drones. In your view, um, and this is, this is obviously the view of someone that owns a, a drone business and is active within the drone industry, but your personal opinion... You, you don't necessarily see us moving the legacy date for as far as being able to use drones as consumers, but you do see there being labels in place by that point. It's just whether or not the manufacturers yeah. have caught up. I think we will have labels in terms of the specification by the end of this year. Okay. It gives manufacturers a year, but I would just caution against, you know, whilst DJI do like to pump them out at the moment, <laughs> um, you know, and other manufacturers obviously do exist outside of the DJI, but I, th I think, you know, they're going to concentrate on what sells quickly-ish for them yes, under yes, the new thing. Absolutely. So I, th I think ha expecting a range of drones covering everything, that's not going to be likely anytime soon. So you may be left with a gap whereby, you know, um, you need to, have a certain type of drone to do a certain type of job and also on on the point of uh, retroactive labeling of course this is something that, that, that again we're using dji because they are the most active in 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 the in the consumer and prosumer market at the moment um they have said that that is something that they would look at but of course that was an enterprise announcement and 
getting getting retroactive labeling on a, a drone which costs several thousand pounds is of course something which is financially viable um whereas you know the the, the chances of them retroactively um uh, labeling the new air 2s is unlikely they may bring out the a, a revised version because it, it already it's already compliant with the with the uh with the code so you may find actually that from the date the label comes out they then have an an air 2s a um <laughs> or b um which which then has the label on it but of course retroactively um, um making the changes isn't necessarily going to be something that's financially viable for either the consumer or the manufacturer i, I would view this a bit like sort of like a, a motor vehicle safety recall issue okay uh where i think that um like one of our fans we got notified by mercedes it has to go back to get spark plugs changed or something i don't know but so i think it'll be like that in terms of if I'm not saying retrospective is possible because I think some of the stuff that's going to come out for the class markings may not be physically possible in some drones. Yes. Um, but I think for ones that there's a borderline, maybe like Air 2S, um, I think it'll be like take it back to the dealer. They can do certain things and then give you the sticker or something. Yes, which is which is what I, which is what DJI have promised in their previous blog posts, if that's possible, yeah. because they're already designing their drones to meet these requirements um, as far as the requirements that they're aware of. Um, yeah, um, that's yeah. quite frankly that's primarily the ASA requirements, um, which you know, and, and those and some of those are really I don't think they're going to change much in the main anyway. So like that's about the kilojoules of how, yes. how it's going to fall and things like that, the weights. So I don't think any of those categories are going to really change much because that's been after a lot of deliberation. Yes, um, I and and, and it also gonna... it also gives the UK authorities a set of parameters to work with already that, as you say, have already been researched. There may be possibility of some retrospective upgrading, if you like. Okay, but on 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 specific drones, which which perhaps the Air Two S might yeah, be the most saying, likely because it's the most yeah. recent out and they they know it's coming, etc. I mean, the FPV is pretty. I don't know what the kilojoules are, but it's probably yeah. even it flies very fast. A lot. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I'm uh, you know I'm happy to have that under a specific category for us. Yes, yes. But no, um, it's. I think for the Air 2S and onwards, that's your best bet. Yes. Some of the stuff that's going to probably, some of the stuff that may come out in relation to the requirements may not physically fit on a smaller drone anyway. That's right. So exactly. I think that, you know, um, Air 2S onwards maybe be the uh, the first we see where it could comply. Exactly. So so our, our summary to wrap things up is that um, um, it isn't as simple as the CAA just saying, here's the labels, start using them. Um, and it also isn't as, as simple. And we, we then have to wait for the other stakeholder, the manufacturer, to be confident enough to start using those labels and to, to have clear guidance, et cetera, to be able to do so. So there's going to be a lag from that point of view. We we don't necessarily expect the legacy period to be extended. Although I'm as a as a consumer flyer, I'm I'm on the fence on that one as far as whether I think it would be a good idea or not. I, I uh, different arguments I go either either way. Um, and as far as retroactive labelling is concerned, we think that might be possible for some drones, um, but it, it it's again going to be something which is going to be manufacturer led um, as far as whether or not they feel like it's financially I mean, viable. Yeah, you're you're going to have a good notice period. To so once the standard comes out, manufacturers will be able to say yes or not, they can comply. Yes. So once that standard comes out, I would imagine by the end of this year at the latest, um, then that will then be when we know if that's going to be possible or not. So there we have it. Hopefully this video has given you some useful information in terms of the UK drone rules and the upcoming drone class label system. If you're new here, consider subscribing. And if you're still watching this video, hit the like button. I would really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.